welcome to the Russian Rulers History Podcast, Episode 78, The Beginning of the Reign of Terror. Last episode, Joseph Stalin took complete control of the USSR after the death of Lenin by deftly handling Trotsky, Zinoviev, and Kamenev and expelling them from positions of power. Now Stalin's focus was on consolidating his power and it was to lead Russia into a period of terror that would turn neighbor against neighbor, costing millions of lives and incalculable suffering on all levels of Russian society. It is now 1928, and the rightists, led by Buharin, Tomsky, and Rykov, had won over the leftists. Trotsky, Zinoviev, and Kamenev were out of power, and it seemed that the NEP had won the day. That is until Stalin denounced it. The boss wanted to collectivize the peasantry and get rid of the kulaks, the peasant middle class. The rightists were aghast. Buharin was the biggest enemy of the change and he made it well known. He went to the disgraced Kamenev and Zinoviev for support, which they gave him with glee. He then went to Kalinin and Voroshilov, but the two of them who would have been thrilled to get rid of Stalin, were having um, personal problems. The GPU dossiers on them were filled with dalliances with young women who were not their wives. The government newspaper Izvestia had just published an article condemning, quote, older men in authority. The two friends of Stalin quickly knew who was in charge and what they had to do. Kamenev at the point felt, quote, Stalin is a Genghis Khan, an unscrupulous intriguer who sacrifices everything else to the preservation of his power. He changes his theories according to whom he needs to get rid of next. We quarreled so violently that we started calling each other liar, etc. The differences between us and Stalin are many times more serious than our former differences with you. It would be much better for us to have Zinoviev and Kamenev in the Politburo rather than Stalin. Genrik Yagoda, head of the secret police, was carefully watching all of Stalin's opponents and anyone else he felt like. The boss's grip was tightening. It was all his little lambs that were helping him out. In the future, each one of these lambs would be led out to slaughter. Trotsky was finally sent out of the country in 1929. He was put on the steamship Ilyich, alive, and headed away from Russia to never return. Stalin needed Trotsky alive to use as a focal point for taking down future potential enemies. Kamenev and Zinoviev thought that they would return to Stalin's good graces now that he was embracing their positions of 1924 against the NEP. They began to distance themselves from Buharin with the firm belief that he was to fall before them. It was as the master manipulator wanted them to believe. He was lulling them into a false sense of security. But he had other plans as he felt Buharin was far easier to manipulate. He had other plans for his friend. There was a grand scheme brewing in Stalin's mind. He had learned much from his mentor Lenin. He took to heart Lenin's admonition to teach the young to take over. Stalin just took the lesson one step further. In order to bring in the new, you had to get rid of the old. In today's world, you retire the older generation, allowing them to live out their life in blissful peace, thanking them for all they did for their children. Stalin would have none of that sentimentalism. He would retire all the old men who helped win the Bolshevik Revolution, the Communist Civil War, and the economic disasters that followed. The Communist Party needed a purging, a cleansing of all thought except one, the bosses. The ensuing years would show Stalin that he and his mentors before, Kachev, Bakunin, Chernyshevsky, and Lenin were right. Fear was a great motivator to do as you were told. Stalin knew he had to transform Russia from an agrarian, backward, superstitious nation to an industrial giant, 
able to compete with the world's capitalist nations in order to spread the communist vision. The five-year plans for the national economy of the Soviet Union was proposed by Stalin in 1928 to get the country on the industrialization road starting in 1929. The goals set by Stalin and his government were almost, how might you put it, mythical in their scope. There was no way that any of the goals could be met, but he pushed hard to achieve them. Battle lines within the Communist Party were being drawn, and a lot of infighting was going on. Now the leftists came back out of the woodwork to attack their enemies on the right. Stalin sat back, and he relished the infighting as it kept his hands clean. The left were going from staunch Trotskyists to loyal Stalinists at the tur turn of a dime to save their hides. As Pyatikov put it, quote, For the party's sake, you can and must, at 24 hours' notice, change all your convictions and force yourself to believe that black is white. But the people in the countryside and cities were upset and angry at the lack of food and numerous accidents that were happening due to the pressures to produce goods from Stalin. It was then that the GPU and the boss came up with a scapegoat to take the people's mind off their problems and focus their rage on a new target other than the government. They created people they called wreckers. It couldn't be the unrealistic goal of the five-year plans that were the problem. No, it was the traitorous wreckers. Stalin didn't just accuse the old Bolsheviks as being wreckers of the revolution. No, he claimed that there were millions of trained saboteurs of the socialist ideal out there. He told the people that it was their duty and obligation to find and turn over these traitors. If they didn't, they were helpers to the wreckers and guilty as them. The man he leaned on to help uncover these supposed enemies of the state was Genrik Yagoda. In 1927-28, a trial was put on against 53 engineers from the mines of Donbass. Accused as being wreckers, these men could just not comprehend why they were being singled out for prosecution. What had they done? Yagoda's interrogators made it clear to them that they needed to confess their crimes for the good of the country. All 53 men agreed to confess, no doubt put under considerable duress and torture, each trying to outdo the other at the trial in order to help their country and possibly save their lives. More and more wreckers were being discovered throughout the country, with more and more people condemned to death in labor camps in Siberia. Particularly hard hit were religious believers, who were targeted as pro-Tsarist terrorists. Few survived, and those that did were recruited as spies. Even the highest ranks of the Russian Orthodox Church were forced into service of the communist secret police. Next, the Kulaks, the well-off farmer peasant, was to be destroyed. This began on the alleged 50th birthday of Stalin. I say alleged, it, is, it was really closer to his 51st birthday, but in the USSR at the time, whatever the boss said, goes. Back to the Kulaks. People whose families had lived in the same place, the same house, for centuries, were carted away or simply shot. And the lead of this major operation was Molotov, who took to his job with bloodthirsty efficiency. A central commission led by Molotov helped oversee the mass deportations. Of the 21 members of this commission, only two would survive Stalin's purges. The people didn't all go away as sheep quietly into the night. Now riots broke out all over Russia, but all were viciously put down. But as the consummate politician, Stalin put the blame on others for the deportation, whom he called crypto-Trotskyists, and they were just overzealous on purpose in order to sabotage collectivization. Again, the boss deftly deflected criticism of himself by blaming an ill-defined boogeyman. 
Even some churches were reopened by Stalin's order to appease the masses. Still, the murder of the Kulak class continued, with hundreds of thousands dying on their way to their new homes in the middle of nowhere. And now a new target, accused of being wreckers, was added to the train. It was the academic community. Public trials of totally innocent people were staged with the goal of proving to the people that all of the violence was necessary because of a capitalist plot to destroy Russia. Totally made-up stories of confession were orchestrated from on high to paint this dangerous picture. Many were executed, but some were actually brought back from the gulags, filled with fear. Fear that made them easier to control. Stalin created a population of sheep to be led around, sometimes to slaughter, whenever he needed their blood. By 1930, Stalin removed Alexei Rykov from power and replaced him with Molotov, whose nickname was Stone Oss. Yes, Stone Oss was an effective bureaucrat with only one purpose in life, to obey the boss. Now that the old guard was out of power, only Stalin was left to listen to. Starvation was rampant. Millions had little or nothing to eat. The countryside was awash with people little resembling human beings. They were skeletons. The number of people who died because of this is really impossible to accurately state, but the estimates range from 5 to 8 million. No matter how you cut it, Stalin is to blame for every last one of those lost lives. But he had help. Lots of it. Just as Hitler had his SS henchmen help him attempt to exterminate millions of Jews and other, quote, undesirables, Stalin had his GPU thugs help him murder, directly or indirectly, millions whose only offense was that they lived in Russia in the wrong place and the wrong time. Many who died early may have been the lucky ones, as the suffering was on as grand a scale as has ever played out in human history, with the exception of Mao Zedong's slaughter of the Chinese people. But then again, Mao had a teacher, and his teacher was Stalin. The boss now had to get rid of his former friends, Kamenev and Zinoviev. He handed the job to Yagoda to create a show trial, which would be viewed by the world. Its mission was to show the world that the accused were to blame for all the horrors of the previous few years, not communism. The trials, though, would not go off as flawlessly as Stalin would have liked them to. Stalin was also working on the industrialization of Russia. Even though his country was starving to death, he needed cash to build factories. He did this by selling millions of tons of grain to Western Europe. One thing positive that can be said about Stalin here is that he knew that his country needed to be taken out of the Middle Ages-like agricultural economy and brought current into the industrial change, or the industrial age. This change is the main reason why Hitler was stopped in 1942 and not the Russian winter. Stalin's building of the industrial capacity of Russia gave him the ability to build the tanks, Guns needed to turn back the Wehrmacht. He learned the history lessons of the Tsars, who did not supply their armies correctly, losing the Russo-Japanese War, the Crimean War, and World War I. Without it, the German army would have rolled through Russia all the way to the Pacific, threatening the United States' west coast. But oh, at what a terrible cost. Back to Stalin's enemies. By the fall of 1932, an uprising of the remaining old Bolsheviks was brewing. Martimian, Ryutin, Ivanov, and others got together in Golovino, a small town outside of Moscow, to discuss Stalin's removal. They felt that they could somehow awaken the people in charge to expel Stalin, just somehow. How naive they were, as the GPU knew of the meeting, which meant... The boss knew, as well. Buharan was sent a note which read in part, quote, 
No change can be expected while Stalin is at the head of the Central Committee. Stalin, the great provocateur, destroyer of the party, grave digger of revolution in Russia. The whole country has been muzzled. Lack of rights, abuse of power, arbitrary use of force, progressive pauperization of the village, conversion of the countryside into wilderness, naked coercion and repression, literature and art reduced to the level of handmaidens and props of the Stalinist leadership. It goes on to say, We can either go on as we are, uncomplainingly awaiting the destruction of the dictatorship of the proletariat, or else we can remove this clique by force. Now because of this letter, Stalin had his reasons to go after his enemies and put them on trial. So on September 15, 1932, the new purge began. Kamenev and Zinoviev were put on notice. Ryutin was arrested and sentenced to 10 years in prison. Many others were picked up and sent away to prisons constructed by the Tsarist regimes. They were by far not the last. Then came an event that was to shatter Stalin. On November 8, 1932, after a heavy bout of drinking, Stalin's wife, Nadia Aleluyeva, shot herself in the heart, dying instantly. Join me next time as we follow Stalin through the Great Purge, which was to devastate all levels of Russian society on the verge of World War II. Now, today's group of interest is the GPU, or OGPU. The GPU stood for, in Russian, and please forgive my pronunciation, it's the Gozyudarsvenoi Politischkoi Upravlinie. It replaced the Cheka as the secret police organization of the Soviet Union, as it was under the auspices of the NKVD. Initially, it was headed by former Cheka head Felix Dzerzhinsky. Now, after Dzerzhinsky's death, it was led by Genrik Yagoda, who helped stage the first of the record trials, starting with the Shatki Donbass trial in 1928. The trial was one of the first show trials of the purge period under Stalin, where 53 men were accused of betraying their country to back the capitalists who were determined to end the socialist nation. Many in the Politburo was a, were against this form of intimidation, but Stalin, whose power was becoming greater by the day, said that the wreckers, quote, weaken our economic power by means of invisible economic intervention, not always obvious, but fairly serious, organizing sabotage, planning all kinds of crises in one branch of industry or another, and thus facilitating the possibility of future military intervention. We have internal enemies. We have external enemies. We cannot forget this for a moment. By 1934, the GPU, OGPU, was reintegrated into the NKVD, with many of its members joining the secret police NKVD before being made part of Stalin's great purge of the late 1930s. Yagoda was caught up in the purge, being executed himself in 1937, replaced by Nikolai Yezhov, who was also executed in 1940, and that helped to end the mass murder spree known as the Great Purge. Well, I hope you enjoyed today's podcast. Please join us on Facebook at the Russian Rulers History Podcast Group or the podcast website at russianrulers.podhoster.com. Remember, there's no www in front. And there you can post a question, make a comment, or put forth a suggestion. So, as always, das vidanya i spasiba bolshoya.